Today on Internet Marketing Pro, we have an extraordinary guest with us. His name is Brad Richdale. He's a direct marketing legend in the business, and he is an American entrepreneur who has sold over 20 million units of products globally through direct response. He is a proven veteran in front of the camera as an actor and spokesperson and behind the camera as well, being a writer, director, and producer. In 1987, he starred in a feature film based on his syndicated television show, Choice Cuts. He also turned an investment of $100,000 to over $135 million in gross revenues, all funded through internal cash flow, while winning two infomercial of the year awards in 1996 and 1997. His uh, infomercial also held the longest number one spot for the decade of the 1990s, 21 months. He also was uh, in the infomercial with NFL Hall of Fame quarterback Fran Tarkington. He has also fought multiple 13 Ds with the SEC and has been part of a group that won a proxy fight and ousted all corporate officers at capital T-A-L Tally Industries. He is the founder and chairman of Phototetica, which is P-O-H-T-E-T-I-C-A dot com. And it's a medical device company with the only globally patented solution for C-I-P-N and diabetic P-N and peripheral neuropathy. Broadcasting from the great North Woods Lake region of Southern Maine. Good morning, good evening, wherever you may be across the nation and around the world. I'm your host, Chad Deckard, and welcome to our Internet Marketing Pro and EZingenerator.com podcast show. Our shows will cover how to grow your business as well as topics on tips, tricks, and techniques, digital lifestyles, the future of finance, entrepreneurism, and preeminent professional internet marketers. Thank you for tuning into our show as we begin this adventure together exploring many great things to come. Now let's cover a quick few announcements before we get started. And like I always begin my shows, I really like to show my appreciation for all the feedback that we have been getting from you. What a difference it makes in motivating me to put these shows out and continually think of the next subject matter that we can explore together. We also would love to invite you to subscribe to the show yourself and take it with you wherever you go on your mobile device on either YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher Smart Radio, Zoom, GeekCast, and many other syndicates. If you like our show and find it resourceful, please do your social network a favor and share, like, post, and leave a comment to our show. Also, be sure to visit ezinegenerator.com and become a free member of our highly resourceful total online marketing presence community to get exclusive access to thousands of quality marketing resources at your fingertips. And finally, be sure to review our past archive shows on iTunes, Stitcher, Get your smart radio, YouTube, and Zoom. Now, let's get down to business. Hello, and welcome to Internet Marketing Pro. This week, we have a special guest. His name's Brad Richdale. Welcome to the show, Brad. Hey, Chad. Good to be here. Today, we're going to discuss a very interesting topic. Since we're getting ready to go into the, the selling season, I wanted to uh, obviously uh, discuss uh, how to double your net profits without additional capital. And uh, you seem to be a real uh, expert at that. You had one time, uh, about a decade ago, did a, a series called uh, Secrets of Success. And uh, I wanted to cover that subject matter with you. And I'm going to go right into my uh, first question on that. And that is, what is the nature of quantification of results in everything that you do in business? Well, let's kind of, there's kind of two questions there. One is, how do you grow out of cash flow? And then the second one is, how do you quantify those results? And they're kind of one and the same. Um, you have to have the same mindset. But, you know, in, in quantifying results and growing out of cash flow, that's kind of the essence of direct response marketing. But there's parameters and fundamentals to direct marketing that if you oppose them and don't follow them, it's pretty hard to succeed. And here's the first parameter. The first parameter is, is if you have a product, um, you've got to have a markup of five to one. This is, this, that's why inf- information has been such a popular uh, item and element in direct response marketing for years because the markup on information is a lot higher than uh, things like slicers and dicers and kitchen gadgets. So let's say you have a product and you, you make it for a dollar, you sell it for five dollars, you don't sell it for less than that, you have a five to one markup. Uh, the second thing that you need to figure out is what is your cost of media? And, you know, I'll give me a great example. We, we use CPA on the internet cost per acquisition on television we use cost per order and, and other mediums, direct response mediums. But the reality is is we, we usually want to try to hit no higher than a twenty five percent cost to market our product. And so if, if we've got a twenty five percent cost to market, the markup is five to one from our cost to what we get for our product, it's pretty easy to grow out of cash flow. 
and it, it just becomes a function of simple math. So again, the, the numbers you really want to look for is you want to look to a 5 to 1 markup on your product, and then you want to try to keep your advertising in around 25% cost of sale. When you have numbers like that and you follow these basics, it's not hard to grow out of cash flow, and it's not difficult to expand your advertising uh, by 10 to 15% every week, provided you're getting paid on the spot when you sell your product, which of course is one of the great benefits of direct marketing is no accounts receivable. I agree with you. I used to say to people uh, years ago, actually, I got your course, Long Time Secrets of Success, um, back in the 90s, and uh, was on your infomercial as a guest of yours. And uh, I remember when the uh, stockbrokers would call me up and want me to invest in some of these dot-com stocks, which I did a couple IPOs, but I said, unless you can tell me how to increase my uh, margins by uh, 500, 800% in the next two months, I really don't have anything to talk to you because I was following a lot of the steps that you taught in sure. in regards to quantifying results. So, uh, you know, I couldn't make that kind of money in stock. would be better off if I just kept turning it over in my business than uh, someone else's business. But, yeah, that, that, that's, a good, that's a good point is, you know, I'll, I'll give you a great example. Guthy Ranker's been in the business for years, and uh, Greg and Bill together are worth a billion dollars, uh, but they consistently keep on putting money into their business. And you just brought up a really good point is, one of the great diversions in life is when you get a call from a stockbroker or several stockbrokers or whatever, you know, people trying to sell you an investment. But you just brought up a, a really major point. And I've got a friend here locally who's got a software company, and it took me a couple of days to prove it to him. And this guy's a very successful investor also. But I said, you know, the best place for you to invest your money is back in your business to grow your business. And, you know, no one's going to sit there and tell you you can get 100% returns on your money every week when you buy an investment. In business, in direct marketing, it's not uncommon to have those types of returns on a weekly basis. Absolutely. And, that, and that, that's really how you mushroom. You know, as you keep on mushrooming up sales and profit, you're then able to reallocate money you know, into other advertising means. I mean, in our case, you know, we took $100,000 and did $138 million, uh, in gross sales, all funded through internal cash flow. And, you know, once you understand these basic numbers, and I can't stress enough, the basics of direct response don't change. If you adhere to those basics, you're going to do really well. Five to one markup, uh, try to do $4 in sales for every dollar in advertising, four to one uh, return on your investment. If you can do that, you can start to grow, you know, gradually and, and sometimes very, very quickly once you mushroom more and more profit. Yeah, back then, actually, you spoke a lot about uh, classified advertising, and uh, uh, I was actually just coming out of college, and uh, I did that, you know, and I actually got into the point where I'm running almost 10 million newspapers or magazines or these little weekly flyers on a daily basis as far as my circulation, and I did exactly what you, you know, what you prescribed in the in the Secrets of Success, and and uh, but today, of course, the class of arts quite aren't, aren't quite as effective as they used to be in the 90s. But now we have, you know, Google and Google Analytics, which I think is even more powerful because back then it was more we had to manually key our, our, our ads and, and track, you know, our sources and find out, obviously, you know, who are the winners and who are the losers and who are the dogs that were just kind of sure. mar marginal borderline profit or loss that could be potentially pushed over the line to become profitable. So that kind of leads me to my next question, and that is what are the basic essential elements of business? Well, look, it, it, it's funny. Uh, I saw Richard Branson recently, and he was on an interview on Fox Business Network with Liz Clayman, and he basically said, he said, don't go to business school. Don't waste your time. This is Richard Branson speaking. Right. Um, start, start a business. And he said, you'll, you'll learn by starting a business. Uh, interesting enough, Branson dropped out of high school. He dropped out of prep school, I think, at 16. Was not a, a great student. But he started his first business when he was 16 years old. And the fundamental in business has never changed and never will change. You've got to make more than you spend. And as, as silly and as simple as that sounds, most people don't know fully what their costs are on a line item basis in the business. And that's why direct marketing is so much simpler than so many other business models is the whole design of direct marketing is based on basic math. And if you follow the basic math, at least a five to one markup, you know, advertising, we return $4 for every dollar you spend in advertising. If you follow those two things, 
uh, and you run an ethical, you know, business with your customers in mind, it's it's pretty, you know, pretty likely that you're going to succeed provided, you know, you keep on with it and you don't give up. So really the fundamentals always come back to one thing. You got to make more than you spend, but the reality is, is most people don't have a control on their costs. They don't know what their cost is. And I've met entrepreneurs for 30 years throughout the country, and when I speak, they'll sit there and say, "You know, that was my problem. I, I bought a product for 50 cents and I sold it for a dollar." One of the hardest businesses in the world is retail, and retails. You know, whenever I walk into a mall and I walk into a store. As, as an entrepreneur and a CEO, I sit there and I think, okay, I've got the overhead of the lights, I've got the overhead of the rent, I've got to pay the, the mall a gross percentage of my sales, and mm-hmm. then I've got my product costs. And, you know, retail is a very, very tough business. It's hard to make margins because there's so many costs involved. So, again, it always comes back to the fundamental. You've got to take in more than you spend, but you've really got to focus on basic math. What are my costs? And you have to track those costs daily. That's the good news with direct marketing. And, and by the way, you know, you mentioned something about classified ads. Classified ads haven't gone away. They've just morphed into get ads on Google, Bing, and Yahoo. Exactly. The difference is, is, is we have a much more complex system. You know, relevance is really important, and, and really what you have online is you have to constantly be expanding uh, your web property to increase the relevance and control your ad costs. That's probably the biggest curve, and it's frustrated a lot of people, including myself. And one of the reasons we come to people like yourself is, you know, it's hard to run a business. And when you throw in all the extra added things that you have to do to control your advertising costs on Google, Bing, and Yahoo, when you throw those in, it becomes really, really complicated. And and that's one of the reasons why a lot of people have gone out and and looked for folks like yourself to help them because there are more complexities. But the, the classified ad hasn't changed. It just morphed into online ads. Yeah, I totally agree. And, I mean, if you look at them, they're basically, what, four lines and uh, 30 spaces wide, and that's pretty much a right. typical advertisement as far as a classified ad, you know, as far as Correct. size and everything. And But, yeah, you're right. It's gotten more complex and how you need all these tools in order to analyze the millions of other ads that you're competing with, and it's a fluid market instead of something that's more set in stone like print where it just changes from week to week. And, you know, uh, I, I – Figured out all the tricks doing that, how, you know, I could beat the classifieds, like, you know, putting a dot as the first character and being the first ad underneath, like, say, work at home opportunity or something like that. And we sure. got, you know, increasing the size of my ad because I got the header and, you know, and un- right, the first ad and then I'd put one, two or three more ads in there, you know, to increase my exposure and, and response rate. So, you know, there's all kinds of different complexities and programs that make it kind of, um, I guess overwhelming for people today in order to get um you know on board with that, and that's why they actually have certification program now for each one of these programs because it has gotten so complex. That's a, that's a big word that's really applicable. Is it is overwhelming, and it's uh, it's interesting with me, and I'm sure that business owners when they hear this will identify with it, and also internet marketers. You know, you, you sit down and you when you start to finally dig into this, because a lot of people dig into this and try to understand how the Internet works and relevance and Google AdWords, because they've hired so many people that suck, that did a horrible job. I agree. And they lost their money. <laughs> and they're, and, and the, the, the difficult part is, is you go from one vendor to another vendor to another vendor hoping that things will change. And I, I just mentioned this friend of mine who owns a software company. He's been through this. I mean, a very, very bright guy. This guy writes code for a living. And what he realized is, is there's no consistent good housekeeping seal of approval or whatever you, you, know, you want to put on it that tells you that if you use this specific business person, you're not going to get screwed. But you know, what happened to me is I just got so tired, uh, and, and I certainly don't profess to know a lot about you know, the Internet. I know a lot about writing ads. But what I did do is I, I sat down and I strapped myself in a seat and I said, you know what, I'm going to learn as much as I can. And I know enough now, and I, I really would encourage any business owner to do so, is I know enough now so that someone can't hand me a line of baloney when I'm looking for a company to do things for me. I, I know enough of the terminology, terminology. I've done enough of the work online where I understand how it works. The other thing I'd suggest is, you know, aside from yourself, is continually keep seeking knowledge of how to improve your internet model. 
And, you know, the reality is, is there's a lot of folks that, you know, as you know, if you have an email account and a credit card, you can post an ad on Google. But interesting enough, 90% of the advertisers on Google break even or lose money. So it really tells you how little knowledge and, and mastery of that medium is really out there. But I think the biggest frustration is business owners are overwhelmed because there's just more plates spinning in the air. And that, I think that's a difficult part. That's, that's probably why a lot of people call you to get the services that you have. They're just overwhelmed. Yeah, and I can't claim that I'm a, an SEO expert, you know, but I can tell you this though, I have, uh, I've got a lot of knowledge at it and, uh, I've managed some pretty large budgets for large financial conglomerates, predominantly in the payday lending, uh, uh, debt settlement, uh, dating and, you know, those types of vertical markets uh, and getting out and generating leads. And, you know, one thing I really stressed was, you know, like you said earlier, that uh, a lot of people just kind of barely break even or lose a little bit of money. And that's where, once again, going back to what I learned from you, because you were one of my earliest mentors because of my age at the time coming out of college, was you got to develop that back end. It's got to be right. all about that back end where you can recoup that 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 loss or right. whatever, you know? Well, I'll give you, I'll give you a great example of it. Um, you know, right, right now, I own a technology company. Um, it's a medical science. We can do something that no one's ever been able to do in regards to the treatment of uh, patients with chemotherapy along with AIDS patients and diabetics. And pretty fascinating technology. But in our business plan, we don't have any forecasted back-end revenue. And part of the reason for that is, you know, our margins are great with our lead product, but at the same time, it's such a hard concept to teach to investors, investment bankers, uh, and other business people. A lot of them, they've just never heard about this. And the simplest thing I'll tell you that's probably the most important thing for you to remember is the easiest person to sell is the person you just sold. Exactly. And they're favorably, they're favorably disposed to giving you more money for something that's synergistic, complementary, uh, but something that's that's going to make their original purchase better. So, you know, it, it's important to recognize that that back-end marketing, the value of the relationship with your customer is critically important because the lead cost that you have as a result of back-end marketing, that lead cost goes away. You've already paid for the lead. You might as well go back in and find an offer that's synergistic, complementary, and enhances the initial experience that your customer had. I agree with you, and that kind of leads me to two more elements to add to this conversation here is one being that I, I learned this from you, obviously, again, <laughs> and that is, you know, as a business owner, it's very important when you're first kind of getting into business or launching, say, a new product or service, or even if you just kind of need to go back to basics and reconsider your strategy moving forward if things aren't quite working, is you need to kind of be closer to your clients as the business owner by getting on the front lines and speaking to those clients who have bought you, and I'll let you take over the things that you should be yeah, that you know, yeah, that's it. That's a really good point. Is um, you know, I was, I was speaking with an entrepreneur about a five billion dollar business in Philadelphia recently, and um, and he had bought my course from TV, and and he probably was right around the same age as you when he did. And uh, he said, you know, one of the things that we really found helpful was actually calling the customers that purchased from us and ask them why they purchased. And I know that sounds really, really simple. But the reality is, is very few, and, I, and I've, I've been consulting with business owners for 35 years, very few business owners have any idea why their customers buy from them. And they've never, and it, you know, it's interesting too, and this is, this is somewhat of a slam on the internet, we, we depend too much on software and software programs and analytics, but rarely do we pick up the phone and call someone and say, hey, by the way, I'm the owner of the company, and you've been a customer for a long time. And I just want to ask, you know, why did you buy from us, or why do you keep buying from us? And sometimes people don't want to open up that conversation because they think they'll cause themselves a lot of grief. But the reality is, is folks are always interested in telling you, this is why I buy from you. And at the same time, you can often ask them, what would you do differently? How would you make the buying experience better with us? Where's, where's some of the problem areas? 
And as simple and as low tech as that is, it is a way to find out exactly what turns people on, what turns them off, or what turns them on even hotter. So getting on the phone with people is really important. Sending emails and using, you know, SurveyMonkey or some other type of survey, like, wonderful, but you're not going to get the human touch. And when you get the human touch, you'll understand because people will tell you and you'll understand their emotions as a result. So I had this business owner, you know, as a direct response business, to go out and ask a hundred customers. And I was pretty impressed. I said, you know, go do this and call me back when it was done. It was done in two days. As soon as you start to get those answers as to why people buy, that helps to reformulate your advertising. So if 64% of the people bought for reason number one, and reason number one was uh, better selection, you know, for instance, better selection is the reason they bought for you. Well, now you can spend more time outlining better selection as a predominant benefit from buying from you. You know, I, I work in a world of 60-second ads, and in television, the tough part is when you get a 60-second ad, you need 12 seconds for the tag screen. So you really only have 48 seconds to sell. And in that time period, you better be really, really accurate of what you're saying and how you're communicating it and how much time you're spending on it. So when you get into a 60-second ad, it becomes very, very finite. It's very, very tricky. And at the same time, it forces you to focus on what's my top benefit, what's my number two benefit, what's my guarantee. And again, I can't stress it enough, if you want to know how to sell more, ask people that bought from you why they bought and and ask, you know, what can I do to make the experience better? What what don't you like? You know, what was the last time we did something that really turned you off? It's interesting, they get they never get inquiries like this, so that when you approach people with that type of inquiry, they're pretty receptive. They'll usually open up and tell you a lot. I agree, and this is kind of interesting. I saw this uh, posted by Seth Gowden yesterday, and he posts, uh, the closer you get to the front, the more powerful you have over the brand. And then he refers to uh, Krulak's law as simple. It's soldiers in the field interacting with local people are the most important element in nation building and counterinsurgency. And uh, it's it's true. You, you know, I think today, you know, we've gotten so detached, even though we think we're more connected with all these devices and social networks and all that, we've actually become so much more detached. It's almost relevant even in our government, not like Boy, it, listening it, to the people, yeah, you know. You're, you're hitting on a big, big element is, you know, it, it's funny. I don't know if you know what a ganglion cyst is. But I got one a few months ago, and it was because I was typing so much with my with my right hand and my right hand's thumb, and uh, it comes from the overexertion and overuse of a device. You give a person that's a type A, you know, ADHD like me, obsessive compulsive, you give them these devices, and the mind immediately thinks I've just got to stay connected 14 hours a day, or I'm going to miss out. And the reality is, is there are so many people that are overconnected with social media, overconnected with these devices, and they're missing relationships, not just in their business life and their personal life. And they, it's really caused a, a giant problem in our society. You know, right now a lot of the business owners are listening. These are people that are, you know, in my age group. You know, stress is the number one killer in our society now. I think the biggest thing that's causing stress is all these devices and the anxiety that they cause in being connected. And, you know, one of the things I've found is when I sit down to watch a film, I turn my device off and I put it in the closet. Because if I don't, I'm going to come up with ideas and think, oh, I'll check on that and check on this. <laughs> so I, I, I think, I, no, I do. I, I think it's a real obsessive element, and, uh, and I understand it. And at the same time, you know, I see the danger of it, and I think a lot of people realize that the average person right now that's on social media is hooked and dialed in nine hours a day, yeah, which is, is vastly that's vastly worse than what television was. So, you know, sometimes it's important as a business owner to unplug, turn everything off, don't take any phone calls, and really have the time to think about what you're doing and how to make it better. And you know, one of the things that we were talking about the other day was very few people step back in business, especially in direct marketing, and every month say to themselves. How can I double my sales? And if you're not asking yourself, how can you double your sales, then you're probably caught in the weeds and caught in the operations of your company and, and you're too overwhelmed by those things because the reality is is most business people never step back and say, how can I double my sales? And I can tell you this, 
sales solves a lot of problems. If you've got great cash flow, life is easier when you're running a business. Sure does. So it, it's always important to do that on a, on a disciplined basis. Every month, sit down and say, okay, how can we make this work better? How can we double our sales? And you know, again, as you know, that's the great thing about direct marketing is we can go to other mediums. If if you're if you're, you're online, you can test radio. If you're on radio, you can test TV. If you know if you're on TV, you can test online. All these things are a matter of getting in front of more people with your message. Once you know your message works, your job is then the ability to multiply your message to more mediums and to more people. I agree. You know, it kind of leads back to, you know, going back to the elements that we were speaking about before being you know, detached and all that. You know, with a lot of people that I speak to today, you know, all these social marketers, you know, they're not bragging about, you know, how many friends they have or how many times somebody retweeted or how many, you know, Twitter followers they have. Do you know, single-handedly, I know you know this answer, but what do you think is their, their number one thing of what they love to brag about the most? Uh, I don't know. Oh, I really don't. The mailing list. And once again, sure. the customer list. Going back to what we were saying prior to that is right. they all will come back and say that that mailing list – um, is the most important aspect of their business, you know, and even that has gotten even more complex today, even though you still might have, say, a, an auto response system like, say, a Weber it's, or an Infusionsoft. Uh, it really comes down to being able to segment that list down to relativity of why that person subscribed to that list in the first place, right. because it's not just like, oh, here's a... Um, Georgia Pacific paper, uh, I'm interested in them and I'm going to join their list. Well, they've got hundreds of products, so they're not going to want to be interested in buying everything you have. Hopefully, you can segment right. and drill down on that list of knowing exactly the, why they subscribe to you in the first place. Obviously, develop them and build that relationship or that rapport to try to build up and maybe find out and introduce them slowly to other things to expand their awareness of other products and services that you offer. And you could elaborate if you'd like to right. on that. Well, you know, you just, you just said something that, that is true, but I want to qualify it and clarify it. A lot of people will say that their most important asset is their customer lists. And that's not the most important asset. The most important asset is the relationship. That's true. Customers. Absolutely. And and you know, you can have a you can have a database of three million people, but if there's no relationship with those people, right. you know, it's not a real valuable database. So, you know, again, you're you're talking about things that are that are really relevant and you know, probably the best way to describe this is very few people sharpen their sword on a regular basis. And I'm I'm using this analogy that you know, if, if you were in the Knights of the Round Table, round table and you went out and you, you killed people every day with your sword, you made sure that your sword was sharp. You didn't go into battle with a blunt sword. Right. And at the same time, there's a lot of people that go into battle every day with business with a blunt sword. They never step back, give themselves the time to re, re, regroup, regenerate, and think about their business and how they can improve upon it. And, and again, you know, we'll say, even though it's redundant, very few of them go back to the customers and say, why did you buy? And mm -hmm. why do you like buying from us? Well, what, what would you change? And, and it, look, there's some brilliant softwares. You know, SurveyMonkey is a, a software you can use to get surveys done. And I've, and I've used it. And it's, it's incredibly effective. But it's not like speaking to someone. And we've almost created a society where email and texting and, you know, all these different types of mediums of communication have essentially usurped face-to-face -face or over-the-phone communication. And, you know, you can tell me about all the neat technologies you have, but if I get a lead and I get on the phone or I go meet somebody in person, chances are because of that effort, whether it's over the phone or in person, I'm going to sell that person. Someone recently sent to me, and it was, it was Perry Marshall, and he, he said that email marketing is the most efficient, you know, best way to market. Yeah. I, I laughed and I but I thought about it. You know, in his case, he doesn't want to have a bunch of people working for him. He's got a relatively small company, but it's a very successful company up in Chicago. But, uh, you know, he, he for him, email marketing is great. But for people that are listening, don't get confused. Blocking and tackling sales calls over the phone, in-person sales calls, that hasn't changed. And, and we all, uh, you know, we all keep on trying to create these remote-controlled businesses without any extra sales efforts. Well, you know, those are great, 
But there's so many smart people out there creating those types of business models, and there's all kinds of people that are missing the fact where they can pick up the phone, call someone, and make a sale. And you know that's that's really kind of falling by the wayside. Is good old blocking and tackling still works? And at the same time, it's not as sexy as some guy says, "I've got a 24/7 internet business and I'm making a million dollars a month." Yeah, well, that's great, but. The reality is, is I, I might be a little bit of an old timer at 55, but the reality is, is picking up the phone, calling people, making face-to-face -face sales calls, all those things work. The, the internet can become a great place, and so can media, for developing those leads. But um, getting back to the basics of salesmanship seems to be something that we really avoided here in our society moving forward. Yeah, I agree. It almost kind of leads me to thinking about Michael Gerber's e-myth when he talks about the, uh, you know, instead of working in your business, entrepreneurs should be working on their business and putting themselves yeah, yeah. kind of outside the box, you know, and I think that's yeah. where you're going. You know, there's some there's some humor to the Michael Gerber story because uh, years ago we discussed doing an infomercial, and, and at the time Fox Business didn't exist. So we probably wouldn't have had any traction other than CNBC, but I love the E-Myth. It's a great book. It's a great message. If you don't want to buy the book, here's the message. Businesses run better with systems. Create systems in your business, and your business will run better. And the humor is, is Michael Gerber created these systems in his business, and then he decided to take some time off, and uh, his business fell apart mm -hmm. because he wasn't there. And, you know, it, it's, it's pretty interesting. Apple just announced, you know, a, a couple of, features on some new phones, nothing earth-shattering. When Steve Jobs died, so did Apple. And I think that the chance that Apple will ever regain the luster it had, the momentum it had, isn't real high until, you know, one of Steve Jobs' kids take over. It's the same thing that happened to Oracle. You know, Larry Ellison was the one who recently said this on, on Fox Business. He said, you know, Steve Jobs is Apple, and without him, Apple's not the same. Well, Larry Ellison, a few years back, I think it's about 12, 14 years now, he decided to go sailing, and he left an Oracle stock tank. So as green as systems are, the one thing that an entrepreneur has is their business is like a child, and they worry about it, and they're concerned with it, and they're obsessed about it, and that's normal. And you know, the, the, the reality is that if you're not in that mindset, it's really tough for you to succeed. And, you know, and, and look, again, I, I love Michael Gerber. His message was, was absolutely brilliant, but it was ironic that with all the systems he created, his business was tanking because he wasn't there. He was the driving force. And, you know, it's the same thing that happened with Ford. When, uh, when Henry Ford was 56, he had to go back to work because his son had screwed up the business. Mm -hmm. uh, and General Motors was breathing down his neck. So, you, you know, you, you always have to look at the, the founding person. There's a driving person that obsesses and compulses about their business, and if that's you, you know, congratulations, because, uh, you know, you're in the right spot. You're in the right place being in your own business. Yeah, and I've been pretty much, uh, like I said, being an entrepreneur my entire life. I started in publishing, uh, running the uh, school newspaper, which was an interesting story I've discussed. I had actually somebody, uh, I never told you this, but... They handed me the university a half a million dollar business for five grand. Just all I had to do is pay for my attorney. They didn't want to publish anymore. Wow. I said, Can I take it off campus and publish with a couple other guys? They're like, yeah. And I go, done. <laughs> yeah. So we published wow. 20,000 copies three times a week and uh, ended up selling wow. that out of college. And that was my first really great entrepreneurial move that kind of led me from one thing to another. But Wow. You know, you know, and that's what got me into advertising and marketing. So, I mean, that really was that's the great. essence of my start in kind of being a, a, an entrepreneur and a leader. Of course, I did other things when I was younger, you know, sell sure. T-shirts and lemonades and candy and anything that somebody needed as an impulse item, you know. <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah, let, let, let me jump in. And, and, you know, you just hit on something that's really important. Is I know that there's a lot of young people that uh, have entrepreneurial desires to succeed. And you just hit on something that's really important for somebody that's in college or just out of college. If you want to succeed, go to work and try to find some type of, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's hard for a lot of people to find jobs coming out of college. Uh, it's hard for people to find jobs while they're in college. But if you can go to work for an entrepreneur and approach them and say, hey, you know what, I'm willing to work at a discounted rate or for no money for six months. I just want to learn this business and I, I really want help. You'll usually find entrepreneurs are uh, pretty supportive of that. 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's one of the most important things is you will learn by doing, but you just said something that's really important is that you started there and then it started the path going for your life. And and then we eventually met as a result of ordering from television. But when you take that first step, uh, especially as a young entrepreneur and you go to work for somebody, and even if they, you know, they'll all hire you when you, you go to work for no money. Um, yeah. And you show this eagerness, and it's, it's interesting. You show that eagerness and hunger to learn. Um, entrepreneurs get turned on by it, and you know I've helped a lot of entrepreneurs over the years. I have no idea how many, but it's, it's you know thousands, and and I've enjoyed doing it. And it's it's really nice to pass it on to someone uh, that they're going to succeed, and and they have the tools for success. But what you just brought up about the school news- newspaper is a great lesson for people listening, is if you want to know where to start, you start somewhere. And you take the first step. And, and eventually, you know, God will start to move in and, and move your path towards where you're supposed to be. But have the faith to step out and begin. And don't be afraid of failing. Uh, that's the one thing that scares a lot of people. But the reality is, is you're going to learn by doing. You're going to have good days and bad days in life and good days and bad days and business. Don't be afraid of failing. I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting. I was watching something. I was watching a program the other day, and, and um, I was watching a venture capitalist from Israel. I was watching the 700 Club. And this fellow gets on, and he, he said, it's, it's statistically proven that when you invest in an entrepreneur that's failed in the previous business, their chances of succeeding in a new business versus a first-time entrepreneur are dramatically higher. And so what that tells you is is all of your experiences, no matter how adverse they are, they're always part of your learning platform. And once you have those experiences, go ahead and use them. And don't be afraid to fail. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've had my own personal, you know, failures, winners and looters, losers, you know. But sure. like I said before, it kind of... It's almost like a predetermination of, I guess, somehow you're supposed to learn these lessons throughout your, your walk. And those lessons that were hard lessons to learn only made me stronger and more wise. And I think I don't know, remember, I can't quote a who or where I got this information from, but I, heard, I don't, maybe it came from Jay Abraham, you know, the great marketer, the five million, the five billion dollar sure. man. And he said, I would rather work or invest, like you were saying, in somebody who's made a lot of mistakes than has made no mistakes at all. Sure. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, by the way, that's, Jay started, you know, really one of the things that really taught Jay a lot was he went to work for the guy that created Icy Hot, which eventually got sold out. But um, what he learned from the fellow who started Icy Hot was the lifetime value of a customer because the person would give away the first jar for free. He just had to pay for shipping right. and handling. And uh, the lifetime value of the customer is so high. So, you know, it, it, it's interesting that you mentioned Jay. He's um, he's helped a lot of people, taught a lot of people about direct marketing uh, over the years. And there's a lot of named people, you know, that are out in direct marketing that uh, they either, either bought from myself or Jay or somebody that's, you know, in our age group, uh, the late Gary Halbert. Um, and, and they learned a heck of a lot as a result. But uh, Jay's one of my heroes and he knows that. Well, Brad, I really appreciate you uh, coming on the show here today. Well, you've given us a, a great deal of information. Um, it's a great subject matter. I hope that uh, all the listeners uh, get something beneficial out of this uh, conversation between Brad and myself. And uh, I'd like to thank you for coming on, Brad. And uh, would you mind great. telling anybody how they can uh, you know, stay uh, in touch with you as far as you know, your blog or um, you know, any type of you know, you, resource out there that you have available? Yeah, you know, I, I have a, a blog. It's just bradrichdale.com, and I blog about certain things from time to time. It's it's 95% of the time about direct marketing. One of the things that's important, you know, is, is once you have a, a skill and a knowledge base, it's always important to remind yourself of what you know. And so that's one of the reasons why I write, you know, on certain elements of direct marketing. But, yeah, you can get in touch with bradrichdale.com, and um, as a matter of fact, you know, Brad Rich emails my email address. Pretty simple. But you know, if you're listening today and you're stuck in that place where you're frustrated, you've had some recent failures, um, and everything, you know, is difficult. I'll give you two pieces of advice: ask God for help and don't give up. And you know, those are probably the best two pieces of advice you'll ever hear when it comes to business. So, Chad, it's been great getting together with you, and look forward to seeing you soon. 
All right. Thanks, Brad. Take care now.